Welcome back. Tom Harvin here with you. And on the line with us is uh, Inga, Inga Frickland, the uh, Dr. Ingler, Inga Frickland, uh, pr former prosecutor and assistant state attorney in Cook, Cook County, Illinois, a policy advisor to Afghanistan, f spent five years there. She's a member of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, LEAP. LawEnforcementActionPartnership.org is the website. You can tweet her at Inga Frickland, I-N-G-E-F-R-Y-K-L-U-N-D. Inga, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. So you, as a former prosecutor, as assistant state attorney, um, as a member of Law Enforcement Action Partnership, you're, I would think, very familiar with the needs of police departments around the United States, or at least in, in the Chicago area where you work. And uh, how are those needs being met by Donald Trump wanting to redirect military equipment to our police departments? I think what he's doing is very counterproductive. It's going to lead to less effective policing and probably more danger to the police officers. How? Well, it's encouraging this militarization of our police departments. Remember a decade or more ago, we used to talk about community policing and officer friendly. Mm -hmm. That's gone by the board. Uh, starting in 1997, this is called the 1033 program that gives extra military equipment to local law enforcement. It started out for fighting the drug war and then added terrorism. It's another theory. Uh, it's giving military equipment to local police departments, which is encouraging them to think that they're in a war rather than as fellow citizens defending their communities. And it's perpetuated this us versus them feeling with the police, which makes citizens that much less likely to be able to turn to the police uh, when they have problems or when they know something about who a suspect might be. And if those sources of information get cut off, the police are going to be much less successful at solving serious crimes, and they can be in more personal danger if they're not getting information from their communities. I, Louise and I, a week or so ago, were trying to take a break from politics, and so we went to Netflix to watch some... That's, that's hard to do. Some good old-fashioned dumb television, right? And uh, pulled up Hawaii Five-0. I used to love that show when I was a little kid, uh, back when Jack Lord was in it. And, um, you know, now there's a new version of it. We were watching uh, Season 4, Episode 19, and in the middle of the show... The guy who is the head cop, he plays the role of Steve McGarrett. I don't know the actor's name. I'm sorry. Um, he's got a suspect, not, not somebody who's been convicted or anything, just a suspect. And he's trying to get information out of the guy. The guy doesn't want to talk. And so he starts beating the crap out of him, you know, on television. This is illegal, right? It's illegal behavior for a police officer. And this is sure. maybe the 10th or 15th time that I've witnessed violent assaults by police officers on people who who are not under arrest or not convicted of a crime. And, uh, you know, on this program, on this show, now I, I, I haven't watched, you know, hundreds of cop shows and I don't, you know, I'm not a big cop show watcher, but I'm guessing if this is what, like one of the number, you know, one of the top shows in America, that probably a lot of other cop shows are doing the same thing, glorifying police brutality, essentially. Is this the cult, is this cultural thing or this Hollywood thing infecting our police departments? Do they watch these guys on TV? I mean, wherever McGarrett goes, he's got a SWAT team following him. Do they watch this and say, oh, this is how we have to do it here in Gary, Indiana? Or is it is it the other way around? Is it that the writers who are putting together Hawaii Five-0 and other shows like that, I, you know, not to just pick on them, um, are the writers looking at what's going on in police departments and saying, okay, this is the new reality in America. The police are brutal. They cut the corners. They get around. They, they ignore the law, and they, and they, and they hide things uh, on behalf of each other. What's going on here? And, and is pop culture driving any of this, or is this being reflected by pop, pop culture, or is, is, there a, is there no connection there? Well, I think there's some connection. Probably there's a big circular reinforcing effect going on here. For one thing, as far as the shows go, uh, it's a lot more exciting and you probably get more viewers if you have a SWAT team showing up on the program. It's hard to get drama out of a hostage no negotiator very quietly managing to talk down some subject or suspect. Right. So that's one thing that drives it. Plus, there's the reality that there is 
more violence between police and citizens than I think there used to be. And some a good bit of it is driven by this militarization, which comes from the federal government passing out these uh, tools of war, essentially as toys for police departments. Right. Now, this was the 1033. So more 1033 is the name of the program. It's whatever the statutory. Right. Yeah. Well, this was is. started during the Reagan administration, as I recall. Well, it goes back to 97 is when it was. Oh, okay. So this uh, was initiated. during the Clinton administration. Uh, if Clinton was in, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah was Clinton was ninety-two to, to two thousand. So yeah. okay. So um, the ten thirty-three program, the theory was the military has surplus uh, goods that police departments may be able to use: bullets, uh, you know, uh, holsters, guns, whatever, and and that's how it was sold to us and sold to Congress. But the 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 effect has been. All kinds of, you know, advanced, I mean, basically weapons of war are being handed off to police departments. Has the, has the program been reinvented to actually envisage passing out weapons of war to, 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 to you know, enthusiastically be part of the hyper-militarization of our police departments? Or is this a perversion of the program that just is ongoing because it's profitable to the, to the military contractors who are supplying the goods? Well, as usual, I think there's several things going on. Starting in 97, the express statutory purpose was to help fight the drug war. And then it was several years later that drugs and terrorism became the, the purposes for it. And I think it was passed without a whole lot of thought about the consequences, some of the problems that this would entail. You know, it sounds fairly simple to, hey, let's pass out some surplus military equipment. But, you know, without thinking who's going to get it, who authorizes it, how is it going to be used, what are the consequences, uh, not a whole lot of thought. And I sometimes wonder if one of the problems is how few members of Congress now have military experience. Mm. That's becoming less and less likely. Now, I've never been in the military myself, but I have been de um, deployed in Afghanistan as an advisor with both the uh, the Army and the Marine Corps. So I was riding around in some of these you know, monster vehicles, and I was actually licensed to drive a Humvee when I was in Afghanistan. Uh, this stuff's a whole lot of fun, and I can see why police departments might think it would be fun to – to have it. So it's like toys for boys? I'm sorry? So it's like toys for boys? Uh, that is a part of it. Huh. So it's, you know, it's much more sexy to drive um, a big vehicle than a Crown Victoria. Yeah, being I guess boys and girls. You know. Yeah. But the, when the military is using this, there is a tremendous amount of training that goes with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also been involved in training at both Fort Polk and Fort Irwin, mm -hmm here in the States. And I remember once at Fort Polk in Louisiana on a paved street, a, uh, a big MRAP, these mine resistant ambush protected vehicles making a right hand turn and managed to flip over. Uh, they're very um, high centered. Mm -hmm. uh, another training accident at Fort Irwin, the thing went over an embankment and the turret gunner lost his arm. Ouch. So, the military spends a lot of time training people, not only in the mechanics of how to operate the equipment, but a whole set of training about use of force, escalation of force, so that they know when these things can be used. But under turn 1033, this just gets handed over, you know, like a puppy on your doorstep, uh, to people who have no particular training. Uh, either on how to operate the vehicles or what makes a reasonable use of force right. uh, when you're in some situation. So, so Inga, we're we're just about out of time here, but I'm I'm wondering is there is there any organized pushback to 1033? I mean, President Obama ended the 1033 program, I thought, but uh, uh, no, Trump just brought it back. He didn't end it. Um, he put some restrictions on it so that the most lethal. Uh, stuff was not going to be sent out. 
Um, and that's what uh, Attorney General Sessions has recently reversed. He's willing to give police whatever. Right. Uh, things such as some uh, tactical vests, you know, other office equipment and what have you, that was not stopped by right. Obama. So things which keep police safe, that was continuing. What Sessions is now advocating is giving back some of this offensive capability. And I'm, I'm thinking back to some of the news footage from Ferguson, Missouri, a couple mm -hmm. years ago. Right. The last time I had seen scenes like that was when I was in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, these giant and tanks. Why and... are we turning this on our own citizens? Something is terribly wrong when that's happening. So, Inga, and that's what, an issue that we should be dealing with. We're talking with former prosecutor, assistant state's attorney Cook, uh, with Cook County, uh, advisor to Afghanistan, uh, spent five years there, member of law enforcement action partnership LEAP, um, uh, Inga Frickla, Frickland. Uh, is what, if, if somebody is listening to this program right now and wants to do something to try to stop the 1033 program in the 30 seconds we have left, what can they do or should they do? Well, they can certainly be talking to their congressional representative, mm -hmm. and it's something which should be raised with their local elected officials, because over the last few years, various states had tried to put some limits on this, and the, the federal government seems to be overriding those local limits, because one of the many problems with this is that the equipment was simply handed out to a law enforcement jurisdiction that asked for it completely bypassing the democratic accountability of the budget process in which a, uh, a city or a county is going to have to openly debate, hey, do we really want to buy this stuff? Right. Yeah, because if it's free, and it's like, yeah. Inga, we're out of time, but thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you. I, I, I truly appreciate it. We'll be right back.